Thank you very much, Irene. Uh, and thank you all for coming uh, to the presentation. It's really a pleasure. Uh, being here from the moment I landed uh, four or five days ago, I've only been talking about the weather, the campus, great food, and I've been so uh, uh, nicely welcomed by Ren and everybody else I met um, on, on campus so far. Um, today is the first big event that we're uh, running, or the uh, first uh, bigger presentation. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity to really give you an overview of um, the areas that I'm interested in, um, and which, which vary quite a lot. So I'm going to be covering quite a bit of, uh, of ground uh, in my, um, um, in my sort of engineering education uh, focus journey so far. Um, I, you will see that uh, I will start by telling you a bit about myself, my, my sort of, uh, journey into engineering and then engineering education, a bit about the, uh, the department um, uh, I'm part of at University College London. And in fact, it makes me smile to see the poster here because it says Australia's global university and UCL brands itself as London's global university. So uh, something else that we have in common. Um, and then I'm going to dedicate most of the presentation to telling you um, about the various research projects that um, I'm involved in. Um, so what I'll do so that I don't end up talking to you uh, for too long is that after every project, I'll open the floor for questions. But also this is quite informal. It's a sort of friendly chat. Um, so if you wanted to ask anything along the way, don't feel like you have to wait for me to, um, to finish the section. Please do uh, put your hands up. Um, and then I guess the thread that you will um, um, see through my presentation um, is really how um, important collaboration and student-staff partnerships um, are in my work. So that's really um, a sort of common vector that has uh, followed me um, throughout, and, and I think that's a really great way to, to approach things, especially when you move from engineering into a new research field, essentially, uh, which is um, education. So uh, I'm now going to um, start by telling you a bit about myself. I'm an engineer. I'm originally from Romania, um, and um, I studied there. I studied civil engineering, so I did my uh, Bachelor of Engineering and, and Master over there. And then I moved in the, uh, in 2011, I moved to the UK, uh, where I studied for a PhD in mechanical engineering uh, at the University of Bristol, where Ren and I met. Um, and over there, um, I, when I left, I was a senior lecturer in dynamics and control. So my, my specialism is uh, vibrations uh, and uh, controlling the behavior of buildings subject to earthquake excitation. So that was my sort of technical um, hat there. Um, uh, after my PhD, I also decided to, to study public um, policy. So I did an online certification uh, uh, course with the London School of Economics and Political Science. Um, and that's because uh, while um, doing my lectureship in, in engineering, sort of ed education-focused lectureship in engineering, um, and um, uh, acceding to some um, uh, leadership positions in education um, at Bristol, I realized actually that policy is a bit of a, a missing link sometimes. Uh, and the way in which you know, we, we educate our students and the way in which we train um, engineers would benefit from the inclusion of this extra link that bridges between the technological advancement, which can be quite fast, and then its implementation in society, which sometimes lags or isn't done um, as effectively. Uh, in terms of um, um, employment, I started with some, uh, I dipped my toes into engineering sort of professional work for, for a bit while uh, back home in Romania uh, as an engineering intern. But then quite quickly, I realized that uh, I wanted to study more and that academia um, is, is my colleague, uh, calling. So then uh, worked in Bristol from 2014. So I started my lectureship as I was finished my, finishing my PhD. Uh, which is something quite common, I guess, over there. Um, 
then I, um, um, I went on to senior lecturer, also education focused, uh, and for a few years I was the program lead for mechanical engineering uh, and the director of education for the faculty of engineering. And then in April 2022, so actually early next week or at the end of this week, I'm going to celebrate my two year anniversary at UCL uh, as a, also an education focused associate professor um, there and uh, now Deputy uh, Director of Education in um, our department. And um, I'd like to spend the f uh, next few uh, minutes just telling you a bit more about what it is that we do in these departments. So STEEP stands for Science, Technology, Engineering and Public Policy. Um, and essentially what we do is public policy applied um, to um, the fields of science, technology and engineering. So how um, how is the government working in this area, how we can collaborate globally, not only on the academic uh, uh, stage, but also uh, with people who work in industry, people who work in, in government, in third sector, uh, and so on. So it's all about applying uh, diverse expertise to real um, world uh, challenges. Yeah, I put the name there as well for, uh, uh, for ease. And these are our uh, research groups. So as you can see, um, it, it's, it's tech, but it's really with that link with uh, the people. So how we make decisions in an inclusive and effective way in the 21st century, digital technologies. So this is everything around the regulation of AI, for instance, which is quite central uh, nowadays, but also uh, more than that. Uh, then we have the engineering policy group, which I am part of, and, and that's about um, how um, um, engineering is governed and how engineering informs um, uh, decisions in the government. Uh, then we have, um, groups around energy, the environment, sustainable development, that's something that I'm quite well aligned with as well, and urban innovation and infrastructure. Um, in fact, at the moment on our master's course there, I teach uh, climate innovation and uh, sustainability uh, policy alongside supervising uh, research projects and the PhD um, student on um, in the urban area. So quite a lot of crossover. We like to dip our toes into many waters in the department. Uh, and then health innovation and policy, it's another big um, uh, topic. And here are some um, um, examples of, of current projects in the department. Um, um, IPPO starts from uh, the, uh, stands for the uh, International Public Policy Observatory uh, associated with mitigating the post-COVID-19 um, um, dynamics. Then Petras around uh, the Internet of Things, so very much linked to that digital theme. Strings, uh, which is linked to the SDGs, and this is something quite central to what I do as well. Um, and then uh, uh, climate change, the intergovernmental panel on, on climate change. Uh, in, uh, our colleagues are um, uh, quite, um, quite well involved uh, in that uh, too. Now, the, part, the central part uh, of my role is uh, being the program director for the BSc called Science and Engineering for Social Change. Uh, this is a new program which started at UCL in uh, September 2023. So we just uh, had our first cohort finish their term two. Uh, it's, it's the Easter break over there now. And this program um, is really created to embody this um, uh, merge and this sort of synergy between engineering, um, science, and public policy and the wider social sciences. So it's about equipping students with skills uh, from all of these things and from all of these areas and allowing them to work together in an interdisciplinary space from the get-go uh, because it's been observed, at least in the UK, that uh, usually when people um, get into this interdisciplinary space is later in their careers. It's when um, they've uh, moved from one field to another, a bit like I did, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, then public policy. But now they have an opportunity to be trained in this way. Uh, from, from the start. So our first cohort of students, uh, of 15 students, so we started small because we wanted to have an opportunity to, to iterate and give students um, all of our attention, but uh, we're going to gear up to about 60 students per, um, per year. 
Um, so I've probably already mentioned this, why science and engineering for social change? Because of this appreciation that no discipline can solve uh, complex problems on its own. Uh, and I would say that this extends to no country as well. Um, and, and that collaboration is, um, is very, very important, much like uh, the last goal in the SDGs um, uh, framework. Um, and the idea, and this also backs the fact that we decided to go for small cohorts um, to start with, um, is that students will have the opportunity to work quite a lot with um, industry uh, throughout their time. Um, and with um, charities as well, with, with governmental institutions, just to, to help them see the links with employment and what they're going to do um, afterwards. Um, so on this, I also lead uh, a project. It's the first year uh, project, which is about 25% uh, of the year, because the credit systems, as I understood for, from Irene, is, is quite different. I also um, work on admissions and, and recruitment, uh, and I lead the outreach and widening participation we um, um, strand. And you'll see that that's something that comes into my research as well, and I'll, I'll get to it later in the presentation. But I don't want to spend too much talking about the program and the projects, because that's going to be the topic of my uh, presentation um, at the symposium next week uh, on the 3rd April. So if you want to, to hear a bit more about uh, delivering uh, transdisciplinary projects and how that plays on into a sort of transdisciplinary degree, um, then uh, um, I'd like to invite you to come along. Um, and don't be scared by the whole day. You can come for selected <laughs> bits, I'm told. So um, that's all good. Now, uh, what I'm going to go into uh, next is this idea of transdisciplinary engineering, which is starting to be more prominent in, in research and now in, in education as well. And I would say that in the UK, uh, and I know a couple of examples in the US as well, uh, there's quite a few programs that are starting. When I say quite a few, I mean less than 10, but, uh, and especially at uh, undergraduate level, they're quite rare because there's still that belief that First, you, you sort of train and specialize into a discipline, and then you start sort of opening um, your mind and eyes to more. So for transdisciplinary engineering, I'll use the framework um, um, from the International Society of Transdisciplinary Engineering, which is based at the University of Bath um, um, in the UK. Um, and this is um, sort of a, a, a distinction between TRAD-E is traditional engineering and TE, transdisciplinary engineering, um, developed by uh, Dr. Adam Cooper, who is also an associate professor um, at UCL, and he is the lead of the engineering um, policy group. Uh, and really, in a nutshell, it's about this willingness of the engineer to open up their designs, their decisions, to a wider set of people, criteria, ideas, and spend some time reflecting uh, on and, reflect, uh, and resolving, addressing any conflicts. And this is really at the heart of the program um, that um, I lead. And then over here, we have a definition. This definition was um, um, also created by the um, society with, um, with support from um, the community, so they see transdisciplinary engineering as an evolution uh, of uh, engineering practice, apologies for the typo, uh, that combines um, uh, thought from different fields to create better outcomes. And that's exactly what we're um, trying to, to achieve with the um, engineering policy group. Um, so we have um, engineering for, um, uh, for policy, so that's really how is engineering governed. I don't know about Australia, but in the UK you hear a lot about uh, the governing of science and technology and innovation, but engineering is not really mentioned explicitly, and that's something that uh, we're trying to address. And then also policy for engineering, so from the other sort of end of uh, um, 
of the problem, sort of how policy supports the rollout of engineering solutions in society. And then transdisciplinary practice for engineering um, is, is really about how we make this happen. And it can be through education, that's the strand that I lead, or through um, sort of professional training courses, um, through um, sabbaticals that colleagues take and they go and they sit in governmental uh, institutions to try and uh, make things happen. Uh, and then if you're around London this summer, <laughs> we're organizing a conference uh, between the 9th and 11th of July. I promise you it's not going to be as nice as here, even in July. Uh, so <laughs> get your jacket if you're coming. Um, it's the 31st International Conference on Transdisciplinary um, Engineering. Uh, and the theme, uh, which is actually inspired from the program um, that I lead, is called Engineering for Social Change. Um, so I, I I'm afraid the deadlines have passed, but if you're around and you want to, uh, uh, to, to have a, a look without presenting, please uh, get in touch with uh, me or any of the other uh, organizing, uh, organizers. Uh, and yeah, this is me on the transdisciplinary engineering education um, strand, looking at how we can develop undergraduate uh, and postgraduate programs. Um, in this area, and this is a paper that I presented last year at the 30th edition of the conference uh, back in Thailand, so much uh, warmer, actually warmer than here, I could say. Uh, and it's really about painting this uh, landscape of where engineering education uh, is moving to, uh, to make sure that we can um, deliver the sustainability um, agenda and that we can address complex challenges um, uh, meaningfully. Linked to this, uh, because our program is so new, um, I have started a longitudinal research project uh, on the development of professional identities in a trans transdisciplinary space. Uh, because this is quite critical, especially at undergraduate level. You know, upon graduation, we say, I, I, if you ask me, for instance, I would say I'm an engineer. That's probably how, how I would identify professionally, just because that was my first degree and my PhD. Um, and even without working in engineering for too long, except for the academic context, uh, I would say I'm an engineer. And that's something, you know, that means something to me, and it means something to the people I, I relate with. Um, other um, colleagues in the department may uh, identify as scientists or as policymakers um, or civil servants um, and, and so on. But when you don't have something that you, you know, a clear sort of disciplinary boundary that you can sort of box yourself into, as, as funny as that sounds for 2024, that can be quite confusing. Uh, and we've seen that with students because they came onto the program, they applied, and yet they were feeling like, mm, but I'm not sure, it just sounded really, really well, but what is it actually that we're doing over here? So of course, we, we, you know, we had all the conversations repeatedly because it's not something that sinks in quite as, as quickly. Engineering as it stands is not a discipline that students necessarily interact with pre-university. Public policy even less. So it really, um, it, it really becomes quite confusing for them. So we wanted to, um, to see how, um, uh, how this develops uh, on our uh, program. It's a qualitative uh, study. Um, and this is, um, these are our research questions. We wanted to understand why students would choose to study such a, um, such a program and what is it that makes them decide uh, about it because it can be seen quite, uh, as, a, quite as a risky decision. Um, and then what expectations do they have? What do they think transdisciplinary education is or engineering is? Uh, and what are the opportunities or challenges that arise from there. And, and, and funny enough, uh, as program lead, I had one-to-one -one conversations with uh, many of the students on, on this topic. And it transpired that they didn't really even have a clear understanding of what to expect from engineering, let alone transdisciplinary engineering. Um, and um, um, we've written a paper with my colleague Natalie Wind from UCL. Um, that we're going to uh, present at this year's um, conference. 
Um, and really as part of the program, uh, except for the, the teaching, which we try to, um, to have as much as, as possible sort of completely integrated, it's not that we teach a set of engineering modules and a set of social sciences or, or policy modules, no. All of the modules were designed specifically for this program um, and, um, and they uh, take, they draw from either disciplines. I should say that the program is co-taught with the Department of Civil, Environmental and Geomatic Engineering because we focus quite a lot on urban development, um, sustainable infrastructure, um, SDGs um, and, and so on. Uh, and really the elements that bring it all together in, in, the, uh, in the program are the projects. We have three large projects. Um, one is um, the engineering and society project in the first year uh, on human centered design. That's the one that uh, I lead and the one that I'm gonna talk about at the symposium. Uh, then in the second year, so if you think of engineering, of traditional engineering, we'd probably position ourselves in the middle there uh, where we try to create so real solutions to real problems. But we're really, our message is that we want to start um, a step before that. So how we identify problems, how we break down complex challenges, who do we speak to, who do we bring to the table, um, and, and so on. And then in the third year, um, we have the, uh, the third year project, um, which is focusing on, uh, on professional placements. So again, uh, in an attempt to bring um, students closer to, um, the, um, um, to, the, to this sort of work and help them sort of uh, think of what it is that they might be doing after they graduate. Um, now, Again, <laughs> I, I, will, I will talk more about uh, the project uh, at the symposium and that's gonna include also the outcomes of the research project that I told you about. Uh, we've already started interviewing and collected data from uh, the first year students and that's going to inform how we do things moving forward. So if you want to, to hear more about the professional identities work and about uh, the delivery of the transdisciplinary uh, project, please do come along next week. Um, so I'm going to uh, break there to ask if you have any questions. I, I know I haven't told you much about this uh, because I don't want to give it all away too quickly <laughs> before the symposium, but if you have any questions, uh, now is a, a chance to ask. Um, yes? Can you go back one slide to uh, human centered design capable and professional types of technical skills? So, what, why, why did you design it this way? What's the rationale? For mm. So, the rationale was to, um, to try and sort of send the message that um, engineering practice should not be just about solving a problem. That's a common stereotype, um, at least over there. I don't know about here. Um, and because we, you know, there's extensive literature on how engineering solutions many times neglect some categories of people. Um, sometimes uh, they can create a disruption to people who don't even benefit from the solution. That's another problem. Um, so we thought it was really important rather than sort of jumping into solution mode, which is something I recognize in myself as well, step back and start a, a one sort of stage earlier where you're trying to think, okay, this is how the problem is formulated, but really what is the problem? You know, trying to articulate the problem from the perspectives of the main stakeholder, at least if, if not all stakeholders, it's, it's really important. So in that first year project, we work uh, a lot on things like the roles of engineers and scientists in society, sort of social justice, um, socio-technical problems, tools for breaking down uh, and analyzing problems from multiple perspectives, uh, community engagement, um, and all of the sort of equality, diversity, and inclusion um, issues that arise there. And only at the end of term, so now we finished term two, only in the past sort of last couple of weeks of term, I let them think of a solution. 
And it's been a frustrating process because you know they try to fight it, uh, but I was strong. I was stronger, <laughs> and I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't let them do it. Um, and you know, whenever they said something about solutions, I was like, "That's a solution. I'm going to ignore it now, and we're going to go through the, the other steps." Um, and you know, they came to appreciate after we've looked at sort of the design cycle and looked at sort of you know setting objectives, criteria, measuring. Uh, success, thinking of timelines and implementation, they've, uh, they're seeing uh, the, the value of it for sure. And they realized that their initial solutions were no good really uh, because they were missing on so much. And then in the third year, the professional practice placement is really about working in an organization that tries to deploy engineering solutions for the benefit of society. Uh, and students will have a choice if they want to go in, uh, in industry somewhere or if they want to do a research project in Instead. So we're going to offer that as well. Uh, but really, another thing that is unique uh, about this um, third-year project is that there's going to be quite a bit of career input, as also career services input, preparing for employment, and the space to reflect on how what you studied informs your career decisions. Um, so we're hoping that this is quite a sort of comprehensive picture of, of, uh, of how they should be thinking in this space and how they should be then applying that uh, throughout their um, professional lives. So yeah, that's why this, uh, yes. I don't know who was first, but. Is this an individual project? No, uh, so, uh, well, uh, they, there's elements. So there's more than one assessment. This is 30 credit points, which in the UK means 25% of the whole uh, credits of the year. So it's quite a large project. Um, so for example, for uh, year one, we had 40% uh, individual assessment, which is a reflection uh, portfolio. So it's about them reflecting on instances where they weren't inclusive maybe, or when they made assumptions about engineering or other professions. And then we have the group project portfolio. So the, the project itself is assessed uh, um, in, in a group, yeah. Ah, great, thank you. And I, I'm just wondering about, um, I guess, is there a lot of, is there academics that have to talk together because of many different disciplines? Yes, yeah, we how, do. How do you do that? Because I think that's a challenge sometimes. Yeah, it is a... discipline wants to not talk to the other and then... Well... <laughs> You are very right, uh, but you see in this department we are we call ourselves the group of misfits in a way because we all come from we all had such particular trajectories that led us to where they are uh, we, where we are uh, that we really appreciate the power of collaboration and teaching together and working together. So I have not had any resistance in trying to promote team teaching. So many of the modules, projects included, are team taught. So it's not just just one person delivering. So for example, for the first year project, it's me and my colleague Natalie, who I wrote the paper with. Um, and for the first year, I have to admit, it's not efficient. So we had, uh, so for example, the two of us, although we taught different aspects of the course, we made an effort to all to both be at all of the classes and all of the seminars. And that's taken a toll workload-wise, but it's really been invaluable when it's the first time you run a program which is quite different from any other program. Uh, so we think it's paid off and then in second year we can be more uh, efficient. But yeah, we do quite a lot of team teaching with two or three people assigned to the same uh, module. That's something that happens quite a lot in our department. Uh, and also we try to get ourselves you know, out of our comfort zone. So for example, last year I was teaching sustainable infrastructure, which isn't necessarily directly my topic or climate innovation. But it, we really enjoy learning new things and working together. So yeah, we're, we're in a very lucky position from that point of view. Yes. And uh, sorry, there was a question behind you first. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Would you have to compromise the depth of expertise? I I think yes. I think you know to have a very straight answer. Uh, I I think yes. You can't you know someone graduating from this program will not have the same depth of expertise as a civil engineer, for instance. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think they should have either. I don't think that would be possible. You can't do. 
I think less is more, and we want to deliver a coherent piece. And, and yes, so if you want to, if you're thinking in terms of balance, probably we have about 60 to 70 percent social sciences and public policy, and about 30 to 40 percent engineering. So, and it's more sort of, uh, yeah, general engineering, say. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, you know, the engineers who's going to graduate from transdisciplinary schools should be more of the leaders mm -hmm. uh, because they have that breadth of knowledge uh, yep. and, and the vision for the future and involved with the change at the forefront of focus, right? So I think probably that's something that we can think here as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so leadership policy, understanding the funding climate, the political climate, uh, very, very valuable. Now, it really depends how you embed it. Because for example, when I was working in mechanical engineering, students very much thought that non-engineering subjects were second class. It doesn't mean if you call it leadership, it doesn't mean if it's professional practice, it just doesn't matter because it's not called engineering. Yeah. And they were giving us constant feedback. <laughs> Irene will remember about how um, no, at program level, you know, they didn't want to, to do anything like management or... And it's obviously gotten better over the years, but there's definitely that resistance. So I think it, it can be done and that UCL elements of this are embedded uh, into the other engineering programs, but obviously the extent differs because there's just not enough space. Um, and to give you an example, we teach a two weeks intensive course to the whole of the faculty, so to 1,200 students over the summer. So all engineering students, except for ours, uh, do a course called How to Change the World. And that's really about working in multidisciplinary teams. So we have the teams with one student from each uh, engineering department. So say one mech, one computer science, one biochemical, one chemical, et cetera, one management, because uh, at UCL uh, uh, management sits within engineering. And then we ask them to solve a problem. So last year they were working on air quality. Uh, this year they will be working on water. Uh, and sort of water pollution. So uh, we do try to, we provide that sort of policy service to the rest of the faculty, but obviously nowhere near the, the same extent. Yeah. And final question, because I do have to move on. <laughs> okay. Yes. I think definitely from, at least from my experience in engineering, I won't talk about when I studied engineering because that was 20 years ago in a completely different context, but engineering of you know, 2020 uh, in the UK, I don't think I've heard public policy mentioned. I, beyond, I, you hear management, you hear professional skills, but that's more, I don't know, communication, presentation. It's not really, I don't think I've heard about sort of policy and politics at all. Uh, while working in engineering. So that's definitely missing completely. And then from the other side, um, I think the, the application is missing because you train sort of generalists. Um, and, and sometimes there's that extra element of credibility when you want to, to work in an environment. And we know that, you know, going back to professional identities, many times throughout your studies, sometimes without realizing, you develop a way of thinking. Uh, and the way of approaching problems. And sometimes people think they disagree, but they're really just talking different languages. So allowing that space where students can, um, can gain that sort of technical, scientific, and it, ultimately it, it boils down to getting credibility in an engineering context, I suppose, and, and making sure, because we see them as the glue in this multidisciplinary um, um, sort of teams. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I, I think yeah, this con contextualizing it to a particular discipline is not something that I've seen uh, uh, before. And there's a perception that I'm going to talk to 
uh, um, about next week about sort of you can't really do this both things because they're so similar. And then, you know, six months in, they realize that actually they're not that different and there are synergies there and, oh, this is obvious. And social sciences are actually important and, you know, it's not that engineering is first class or STEM is first class and arts, humanities is something else that you do as a hobby, which can be quite often the, the perception, unfortunately. Happily, we cured that early on, so it's all good. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to move us on in the interest of time, because I have a million other program <laughs> projects to show you. Not quite, but um, uh, so yeah, um, thinking about um, uh, the placements, this uh, links into another research project that uh, I'm working on. So the final year project that I also uh, um, lead. Um, and when I was hired, so it was about a year and a half before we launched, uh, and it was to finish the setup. And I thought, mm, we're doing placements, and we want them to have a community-based element. I should also say that we are based on a new campus. UCL has opened a new campus in East London on the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, where the 2012 Olympics happened. Uh, and that area is one of the most deprived areas in, in London, so there's quite a, like part of the vision for the campus is to have societal impact locally. So that's why um, uh, I'm very keen on that community element and I don't want to send students anywhere. Not that they wouldn't learn or that it wouldn't be valuable. It's just because we want this community link. So I thought, well, why not sort of put a research spin on it? Let's see what is out there. How should we do this in a way that we maximize benefits for, um, uh, for everyone? And that's how this um, research project um, started. It's funded by the Center of, uh, for, of Engineering Education um, at UCL, which is a joint venture between the Faculty of Engineering Sciences and the Faculty of Education. Uh, and it's a collaboration between UCL and uh, Queen Mary University of London, both of us with campuses in, uh, in East London. Um, and we want to look into how you go about forming strong regional partnerships, um, which is now an institutional priority. This sort of civic element is present probably on most university strategies. Um, also in an environment where students are looking for value-adding opportunities. They want to have that edge to be more employable, uh, especially with a transdisciplinary degree where they don't really know because, you know, flexibility is a blessing and a curse, I suppose. They know that sky is the limit, but also sky being the limit is really daunting. So um, seeing how we can formulate that and obviously thinking of how future skills develop and what the future skills should be. And if you look through the literature of this, on this, really most of it is focused on the students, the student journey to the placement, the student learning on the placement, um, what they get out of it, how their identity perhaps shifts uh, upon uh, going into industry. But really the idea that I wanted to have central in this project was that uh, we should not uh, place the emphasis on students only. Obviously students are very important, that they are why we're here, and that's why I put this rather sort of weird oriented triangle there, because I didn't want to put anyone at the top. Um, and I wanted to have three main stakeholders for the project of equal value. Uh, the students, uh, the university staff, and the university itself as an institution and the community partners. Because if you want a, a robust, sustainable partnership, you have to make sure that it works for all the parties. We know how many times you say that, oh, we have a placement, but only we know what tedious sort of work goes in the background, all the quality assurance processes, uh, and all of the stress associated to that. So university staff, be it academic or professional services, I don't know what the name is, um, is, is here, um, or careers, anybody, it's really important that they are confident and that they manage these placements in the most efficient, best way possible. And then community partners as well, because these are not your big industry players who have infinite resources and they can just send some people over to help your students. We're talking about very small organizations usually. We're talking about people who don't have a lot of financial or human resource. 
and we don't want to you know, unintentionally uh, go always to the same people. We don't want any type of tokenism or abuse of their kindness. We want to make sure that the community partners get something out of it as well. And we want to make sure that the relationship is managed such that the sort of workload and effort and input balance is really a two-way street. So that's why community partners, and really this is a bit of a widening participation initiative for the community partners because, and again, I don't know exactly uh, about UNSW, but I suppose it's similar. There are these big industrial partners who know how to play the game. They know how to collaborate with university. They know, um, you know how they could tap into the research uh, expertise how they could be working in collaboration for projects. But community partners many times don't know that this is a possibility. They don't know how to access universities um, and, and the staff. So it's really important that their voice is as prominent as everyone else's. And of course, the students. We want them to go there and appreciate social change as it happens, and that's why this community element. Uh, and the particularity with this project uh, on, on my program is that it happens at the same time as other teaching, so it's a part-time placement. So it's really about how we integrate the taught component to, with the placement as well. But I don't want to give much away because tomorrow, <laughs> Um, tomorrow, same place, uh, a bit later in the day, um, uh, I'm delivering a workshop which is exactly on community-based uh, placement. So I'm going to tell you more about the research, um, about the input that we've uh, obtained from the various stakeholders. I'm going to talk about the methods and everything else, show, some, show you some of the data, and then hopefully we're going to work on some uh, placements design uh, and, and you know, thinking through um, to opportunities, challenges, and how best that would sort of come into the UNSW curriculum. I'm sure there's a lot of opportunities that um, you offer um, already. So yeah, if you want to hear more about this side of uh, things, uh, join us tomorrow. Any questions before I move on to the next uh, um, project? Yes, May. Can you ask about your placement and going back earlier to Yes. Yes. Am I right in saying you're using e-portfolios to do that? Uh, we're using, we have, yeah, we're using portfolios, not necessarily e -port I mean, they are submitted online, but, um, so yeah, yeah, the, the, the group assessment is a group portfolio right. for the I project. I call it as e who have done a lot of work mm. e-portfolio in a medic medicine space. It's always interesting to see how, you know, how yeah. like, what needs to, what's the same I think you, you raise a really interesting point there, and also the placement will be um, assessed with the portfolio, because uh, there's quite a lot of parallel between engineering and medicine uh, because of the professional nature of the degrees. So we find ourselves borrowing a lot of what they do. I think they're a bit more advanced than us from what I've seen on the professional side of things, at least, and how they approach authentic assessment. Uh, for example, I remember back in Bristol when I was leading mechanical engineering, I looked at the medical school and I saw they had program level assessments, those OSCEs, I think they're called in the UK. And I was thinking, oh, how wonderful. You know, you're either an engineer or you're not, so how wonderful if we could uh, have something like this. And uh, I, I couldn't do it. It was, um, it would have, I, I left in the meantime, but it would have been quite difficult because it would have changed our structure completely. But yeah, definitely portfolios. That's yes. Right. Hello. Um, so yeah, the portfolio pedagogy that you talk about is very important because it's a habit of mind. Yes, that people develop absolutely. Over time. We've also implemented this within medical science, which is really what we would call a pre-professional program in many ways. Mm. But the development of identity and use of portfolios, I think, is important, as Mary yeah. probably will agree. But I also wonder about the students and their resistance Mm. as you mentioned, to doing this because of the unknown aspect of where their professional yeah. identity actually sits. Yeah. So can you comment on that? Yeah, I this is definitely, I, that's why these two research projects, the one I talked about before and this one, uh, that's why I started them because I thought exactly along the same uh, 
lines. I think in a funny way, we probably, you know, past the initial panic that I talked about, we probably have less resistance because the students are not that entrenched into a discipline. So we have the opportunity to sort of shape them and, and teach them that this is normal uh, and this is how we do things. So they've been quite good on that after they've managed to finally understand the space in which we operated, which I think we're coming to the conclusion is not possible in the recruitment stage. Uh, students don't have enough time to do so much research and visits. So yeah, I think there is resistance, but I must say that from teaching on this program this year and also on our master programs the, per, the uh, last couple of years, I, find, I found less resistance compared to traditional engineering programs. And it's probably because everybody comes from slightly different areas. So on the master's program, for instance, there's graduates from finance, from economics, from languages, from engineering, from computer science. So everybody's different. And also on the bachelor, uh, we have the A-levels, which are the exams that uh, you take in the UK before coming to university. And we have, you know, in, in engineering, you usually have maths, further maths, physics, chemistry. That's pretty much. Um, but then here we have people with sociology, with economics, with mathematics, with physics, with uh, English literature. Um, so I think some diversity of thought already exists. and that plays to our advantage. But yeah, I, I, I recognize what you're saying, and yeah, it, there is resistance. I was going to comment on that. If the, the, by nature of the title of the degree, you're probably attracting uh, folks that are more interested in something of you know, unusual aspect. Of, yes. Let's call it an unusual aspect of the way we do engineering. Yeah, people who are more about, you know, like some of them have told us in, in the research, you know, that they just followed their gut or they felt really inspired or they thought, and I, I really thought that was brilliant. Someone said, um, uh, if I'm not going to take risks now, when am I going to take them in my life? So they do find the sort of, you know, like they, they, they do find it a bit unsettling that it's so new, but it, it kind of worked. So I don't know, maybe there was a bit of luck involved as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. This is closely related to that. What I like about this <coughs> community-based placements is that you are getting these people ready to not only be multidisciplinary, but also to deal with open problems. Yes. Because all they've done at the university, particularly if they've just gone through a traditional yep. university education, is solve closed problems because they're easier to mark. Yeah. Right? But that doesn't prepare them for the workplace at all. No. And when they get into the workplace, they have to deal with real problems, which are open, and they freak out. And yeah. um, what I like about this is it exposes them not mm. only to a range of disciplines, but also the idea that um, you know they, the engineers love to rush in and solve problems mm. before they understand what, yeah. what yeah. the problem is. Yes, exactly. they, they assume that there's a rubric, that there's a subject mm. outline, there's, there are other things that don't exist with real university uh, or with real engineering problems. So I'm impressed. Oh, thank you. I mean, obviously, there was panic. <laughs> On the pro around sort of, oh my God, X is not pulling their weight and I'm doing everything and I'm really stressed and oh, teamwork is hard. And, and I'm like, yes, it is, but it's also the reality of the rest of your lives. So, you know, we have mechanisms at university, you know, quality assurance to ensure that people don't graduate just by freeloading. Uh, but you have to accept it that, you know, you're going to get annoyed. And this is just the start of it. You're going to get much more annoyed once you're, you're annoyed once where you're employed. And yeah, uh, we don't have any exams on the whole degree, I should say. So it's mm -hmm. only coursework. I don't look forward to the marking, but we'll see. We'll, know, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But yeah, you're right. And they do come and ask. We have, obviously, rubrics for coursework as well. And they're like, so how do I score a first? <laughs> I was like, well, <laughs> someone's been reading through outcomes and degree classifications. So yeah, that, that mentality, I think, and probably is the same here, comes really from school. And from schools, really, it's all about the grades. Also, the shock. I don't know about the Australian systems, but uh, system, but in the UK, basically, you know, they come from school where they all scored 95%. And then they come here, and we tell them that, oh, 60 is brilliant. Well done, you. So that's a bit of a shock to them. 
same sort of, oh, but I only got 70. And I'm like, only? You did wonderfully. So that's culture, I think. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a problem. But uh, you know, we'll get there. <laughs> uh, all we have to, to do is sort of keep, uh, I guess my technique has been to be resilient and not give in to too much into the sort of the request because they don't come necessarily from an informed place. So trying to reassure people while sticking to the strategy and to what the program is. Because many of our undergraduates, because we're in engineering, they found us in the engineering prospectus. So they thought this was engineering plus plus, but it's actually public policy plus plus. <laughs> so, uh, so they're like, oh, but when are we starting to solve equations? Well, <laughs> not too soon. <laughs> um, and so we, we had that they were saying, oh, we want more maths. We want more technical content. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry, but this is not what the program is. And some of them haven't done a lot of research. They, they could ha there are people who knew exactly what they signed up for and people who are completely unaware. So in a way, it's their responsibility too. And we have to offer what we set out to offer and fill the gap that we're filling and not sort of, you know, we tried, we, we gave them access to labs and so they do labs and everything. So they have some content, but they also have to understand we, uh, because the other issue, cultural issue is that sort of teacher led element of them wanting someone in the lab, in the maker space. We have a maker space over there too, or, um, or they want someone to teach them the software. And like, no, UCL pays for all of this software. There's tutorials, there's societies. Join them, do, get your, you know, get whatever you are interested in. You're not two students, you know, n nobody's the same as somebody else. So you go and, and you find your way with our support, of course. So yeah, sorry, I don't know. I think I probably went on a tangent. I don't know if I, <laughs> if I answered your question. <laughs> Um, any other pressing questions, or should we move on? Because uh, yeah, uh, still a lot of. Uh, sorry, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes. Sure. About, um, relationship management. You mentioned that that kind of put an Australian's note on the staff. Is that on me mean? mostly as yeah. program yeah. lead, <laughs> <laughs> and then on my colleagues when I was going to offload. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, there was uh, there was a bit of pressure on 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 my time mostly because I wanted to be there with the students where because uh, when they had issues because yeah in the first I, th I think they all started super enthusiastic and then about week three into term one they were like oh! so then I go like oh! <laughs> so, but you know I, and I was thinking uh, then I, after talking to the first one or two I realized that actually it's not as bad as I thought it was they were actually happy they were just a bit confused because I was thinking oh my god they're gonna want to transfer to mechanical engineering or civil engineering but no actually they didn't they really appreciate they, ju they just wanted a bit more context um, and you know we had offered it but I think they're young it's something very new so I didn't mind sitting for you know like one hour at a time. With you? One. One. <laughs> but uh, but uh, they're very happy now. <laughs> All they needed was a, a was a break, you know, because I think um, I think the problem is really that it, it's not only you, you get immediately with this kind of thing you get a bit defensive and you think oh my god people are unhappy, but then actually when you listen to them you realize that there are so many variables, right? So it's, uh, maybe there is a bit of confusion around uh, the course, but then also that element of I'm away from home, I miss my friends, I miss the family. So in this case, the problem was resolved after the holidays, you know, just disappeared. So um, yeah, we, well, I had talks maybe to, with four or five of the students, like one hour long at a time. And then obviously, shorter talks um, as well, you know, I'm, I'm their personal tutor too. It's something we have in the UK where every student is allocated uh, a tutor who is their pastoral sort of uh, support, first point of contact. Um, so I've, I've, I've had a very open door policy, like a no door policy, basically, <laughs> very easily uh, reachable well, by students. Yeah, 
but uh, I, I knew, like, I've been working, you know, I've been a lecturer in, since 2014, so now almost 10 years. I knew what I was walking into. I didn't feel like I was walking into a trap. I, I had this sort of traditional engineering expertise. I knew how things were going there. I knew how much of an uns, uh, uncharted territory this was. I was thankful that the cohort is small because it's, it's really manageable to know everybody. Um, and yeah, I, I accepted it. And I, I won't lie to anybody. It's been an intense year running the program on a new campus for the first time. But I think it's, it's worked really beyond my expectations in the well domain. So it, it's been really, 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 really good. So I, I think it was worth it. So I, that's all like, I've, it's all forgotten <laughs> now. <laughs> Uh, very, very quick. Right. Cause Especially you say that East London, and my understanding is East London is where your law groups will come from. Sorry, quite a lot of what You're groups? You're saying your campus and your community based projects is, is in East London. Yes. And my understanding is East London is where your law equity group. Yes, from. yes, yes. That's what we say. Yeah, there's uh, people from 110 or 20 nationalities in East London. It's one of the most diverse boroughs of London. So my, is your students also from that group or your students from elsewhere? Well, uh, we, we want our students to be from that group. Um, but it didn't work out that way, <laughs> not for the first year. So we wanted them to be from that group. Uh, we wanted them to uh, be at least home students, if not necessarily from East London. The reality of it, so out of our 15, uh, 12 are international students and three are uh, home students. So, and nobody is from London. But obviously, it's really hard because we know that the widening participation and outreach work that we do pays off later. You have to create a pipeline, it's not immediate. So um, now, for instance, because uh, we've just made the offers for the new um, cohort, we did have applications from East London this year. And I've seen at least a couple of offers uh, going to them, uh, if not more. So it's getting better. But the first year, we had, uh, so we had 15 places, 160 applications received, and about 140. 40 were from international students. Most of them just found us on the UCL prospectus. Uh, and it is really hard. The, you know, I've, I've gone into a lot of schools before that and since, and we, you know, I'm going to talk about that uh, in this presentation too. Uh, but it, it's, it's hard to get things off the ground. Now we're, I'm also part of a steering group. Uh, we've uh, opened a scholarship because obviously uh, fees are high, 10,000 pounds for home students. Uh, and you can take out a governmental sort of education loan, but uh, we know that with uh, these communities, sometimes there's a bit of a, um, uh, they're quite, they, they don't want to create debt, especially in the, you know, the cost of living, uh, post-Brexit, it's, it's all very uncertain. So, um, so yeah, they're quite uh, reluctant to, to, to getting loans sometimes and to applying to a place like UCL, which they don't see as a, um, you know, as a sort of natural choice. They go to other universities in London where the home student sort of the international ratio is, is much in favor of the home students. But we're trying to change that. So yes, ideally, we would like, I don't know, half of them to be from East London if we could. It'll and be interesting to hear that in the workshop um, tomorrow or next week. Mm -hmm. interesting yeah, sure, yeah. And obviously, you know, I'm, I'm giving you really, really brief highlights. Uh, but if anyone wants to talk about the program more, I, 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 I'm very happy to organize a smaller meeting or a smaller presentation, anything that works really. Um, I'll be here. I think I'm going to be on campus until the 9th of April, so another couple of weeks roughly. So very happy to, to tell you more. There's, you know, I could be talking the whole day just about the program. So I'll move us on in the interest of time. Um, so I, I already mentioned at the beginning this thread of the staff students partnerships and this idea of co-creation alongside them and the community-based uh, placements project is an example. I didn't talk about that aspect of it because I'm saving it for tomorrow. Um, but um, in there we work with staff and students from across uh, multiple um, uh, UCL faculties and divisions. Um, but I've got 
two more projects um, that I want to tell you about in this space. Uh, one is around understanding and capitalizing on student experiences of blended learning. And here I work with my colleague, um, Dr. Alicia Gonzalez Buelga from Bristol Mechanical Engineering and Professor Sheila Trehar, who is an expert in qualitative research from the Bristol School of Education. Um, and then inclusive engineering education, which is really something that I'm very uh, sort of personally um, um, in, invested um, in um, alongside my colleague uh, Helen uh, Noller from UCL, um, Jules Godfrey from Bristol School of Education, uh, Myra um, Rivera Lopez also from Bristol, uh, so fr from Bristol School of Aerospace Engineering, and then Dr. Mohammad Reza Salami from uh, uh, Birmingham City University, which is uh, one of our teaching focused universities in the um, UK. So uh, I'll talk a bit about these two projects uh, now. Uh, hopefully there will be enough time. <laughs> and I won't actually spend too much on the first one because you're probably, you know, we're all over COVID at this point, so we don't want to, um, uh, to hear too much about it. But I guess the element that I wanted to draw on here is that this is really, for most part, the, um, uh, a qualitative uh, research study, and it's a longitudinal study, and this is not something that you see a lot in engineering education. Uh, literature. Um, so I think that's kind of the sort of value of this project that we managed together with colleagues in Bristol to uh, start working with students uh, when they started their studies in October 2020, full lockdown here and there, probably. Um, so they started online. Uh, and we wanted to see, you know, their perception because there was a lot of unhappiness going on, obviously, uh, for various reasons and very well justified reasons. But we really wanted to unpick what works and turn the narrative around and be constructive, give people what they want as much as possible with the tools that we had. So we didn't start with the idea in mind that this would be a staff-student partnership. We very much started from that angle that um, students would sort of be interviewed or be surveyed for the project. But that's, uh, that's changed. So we looked at sort of how we were doing online learning. We're looking at what the university has done sort of policy-wise, communication-wise, and then we were trying to find what are the key factors for improvement? What is it that we could do? Um, and, and really, um, this is kind of the main sort of idea here about how we kind of changed the role of students over, over the years and the focus of the project. So we started very much with a survey of like, how are you doing? What can we do? Uh, with an idea that through the survey we would recruit students and also inform the design of our one-to-one -one interviews. So we did that when students were in, in their first year. Now, as we moved out of lockdown, uh, we started doing blended uh, or hybrid blended uh, both of them, um, when the students were in the second year. So we uh, started doing focus groups online and in person, channeling on, uh, element, on group elements, really, because there were the, I guess the main tension was around the interaction between students and, and staff. And this is where we realized that students were really invested and they were reporting how important it is to feel that they're listened to uh, and that they have a, a space to, um, um, to talk to us. Uh, and we decided, okay, we're going to select the keenest students who are interested and we're going to hire them as research assistants. Uh, on the project, and that's what we um, do next. We, uh, in, in the third year, uh, we looked at flipped classroom and the use of breakout rooms, just to give you a few examples and how we could, because in Bristol, the strategy was very much around, we are going to keep what worked well. We're not going to go back. I mean, even now, they're still doing online exams in some departments. Still, a lot of the uh, uh, sort of theoretical teaching is done asynchronously. Uh, to save contact time, especially as cohorts increase and there, pre there's pressure on, on space on campus. Um, and then we're now in the fourth year and we're focusing on group dynamics in assessment. Because, and I don't know if this is the case here, so I'd be curious to know from you, uh, but over there, um, 
you start off with individual assessments in engineering because there's a lot of exams. So it's everybody with their paper. And as you move along, you start having group elements, mostly in year three and four. But also that's when uh, the, the marks that you get start counting the most towards your degree classification. So obviously they're like, oh, because X didn't do their work, I'm not going to get a first or, or something, which is, you know, it's understandable. Everybody wants to be valued and rewarded for their efforts. So we're working at the moment, we have three research associates uh, who are undergraduate students in mechanical engineering, um, working on group dynamics and how we can uh, address those challenges. So really I'm gonna leave it here, just sort of selling you the idea of longitudinal projects as a good idea in engineering education and also uh, the qualitative nature of things because in my experience and from the research I've seen a lot of emphasis is on quantitative methods, um, mass surveys, people putting, you know, showing statistics numbers, but really uh, we find it very, very, very valuable to dig in depth. So um, if those are kind of the two main takeaways uh, from this project. And of course I have lots of results and I have them with me. So if anybody wants to, to look into this, uh, I'm very happy to, to chat. Any uh, quick questions about this one? I kept this one very short because I uh, don't want to bring back uh, bad memories. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Got a question, not directly related to mm -hmm. Oh, you're still on placement? <laughs> Save them for tomorrow. No, I'm joking. Uh, the professional placement. Yes. Um, do you have problems finding an office for the student or table for the student to sit in? So what are we... No. Uh, problems with something like that is the student can find a placement, but the place that they go to has no place to put them. Oh, I see. I don't know because nobody has gone on placement yet. <laughs> Our students are finishing their first year now and they're going into the placement in September 2025. So we don't know, but if you invite me to come back <laughs> in 2026, uh, I can tell you all about it. Um, now, when I was at Bristol in mechanical engineering, we did have a year placement there as well. It was a sandwich course essentially. Uh, so you could choose to do the five year program. Uh, and we never heard about this problem, so I don't know. I mean, it wasn't a problem, or at least it didn't come to me as program director. I don't know if others, um, yeah. So, but with, with community organizations, I could imagine that many of them are working from home maybe, yeah, or yes. that they have a very small office. Yeah. Uh, but if they are in, in, if they're local to East London, that wouldn't be such a problem because the campus is right there mm -hmm. and we have a lot of space because it's a new campus. So for the first, at least for the first two, three years, we'll have space. I think after that we'll, uh, over, uh, we'll, we'll outgrow it. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, it could be a challenge. And thank you for putting that uh, on my on my radar. Yeah, it's just a funny one we have because sometimes it's the one student picking the environment. Of yeah. The, people, the right people around them. So when you start having you know people working from home as well as mm. those NGOs that are very small, yeah. they don't really have big offices or places to put people. And yet they are often the one who really offers very good opportunity because they are small. They can really hold you know take the students. Yeah, 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 you're, you're right. And I don't know if we're, that might very well be a challenge that we experience more than in traditional engineering. So I don't know, I have to keep my fingers crossed and, <laughs> and, and see. And we're gonna try, so we've factored into our budget support for the placement. So hopefully, um, you know, we will be able to address um, these challenges. I don't know if we will need to put the students somewhere or to, to support the staff who help the students. We will have to see how it plays out. It's, it's early days. How big of an effort that you foresee in terms of supporting them to find placements? And also, where do you find the uh, community partner? So uh, we have a head of partnerships uh, at UCL East, which is the name of the new campus. So he is in charge of brokering these relationships. And that's really a smart way to do it because you don't all go via various um, channels to the same people to sort of drain resource. And he has this sort of overarching view and he places us like pieces of a puzzle. 
sort of who is better fit with whom, depending on, on what we need, because he's got understanding of our programs and also of the uh, students. But you're going to hear more about that next week at the symposium. <laughs> Uh, any, uh, okay, should I move on then? No questions about blended, I, I, uh, my intuition was fine, we're all over it. <laughs> so I'm going to now um, uh, tell you a bit about um, embedding sustainability in the engineering curriculum, which I guess it's something that's quite uh, um, important nowadays. So this is a partnership with the GW4 Alliance, which is a, an association of for research-focused uh, universities uh, in southwest um, England, uh, well, and Wales for Cardiff, um, and uh, working with my colleague, uh, Dr. Alicia gonzalez Buelga from Bristol and Dr. Dorothea uh, Cerzo from Cardiff University. Uh, we've been trying to see how you might go about embedding sustainability because, you know, in a program like the one that I lead, it's very easy, right, because um, um, because we started fresh with a blank piece of paper, so or my colleagues before I was hired, so it's really really um, easy to to put whatever you want. But if you're dealing with a traditional program, then you have to take something out. Just adding things on like appendices doesn't work, and it also sends the wrong message um, that uh, this is really not that important. Because if it was important, it would be in the mainstream curriculum. So uh, that's something that we tried to, um, to look at. And first of all, we focused what is it that students should know? What do we want them to know? From a faculty of engineering perspective, regardless of the discipline, what is it that we want them to know? What is it that we're currently doing? Because a lot is happening. So there's always this temptation with large universities that you know, the left doesn't know about the right a bit. So you, you, there people, there's great practice around, but the dots are not connected. So um, it's really important to acknowledge and build on those efforts rather than say, oh, we just came to you know, teach about sustainability, which is not the case. We want to draw from the expertise of, of colleagues. And then we were also thinking of the feasibility of creating an online um, a platform for collaboration uh, for students and staff. Because a lot of the time, and I found this myself, you know, when you come from an engineering background, you weren't probably yourself taught much about sustainability, and you've learned it on the go, right? You've, you've learned it out of interest because of the stuff that you've been teaching, but it's not necessarily of, of your expertise. And it's also a very fast, fastly paced um, sort of area. You can't, you know, with engineering, I used to teach control engineering, so, you know, proportional controllers have been the same for tens of years. I didn't have to, you know, don't have to change what you do every year. But with sustainability, you want to bring the latest IPCC report. You want to uh, bring the latest, uh, I don't know, carbon dioxide remover te uh, re technologies, um, the latest case studies. And that takes a lot of time in preparing, a lot of workload associated to it. So it was really about how we go about sharing resources, um, trusting sort of each other, uh, and collaborating. And when we asked engineering academics what it is it that uh, people should know, uh, they talked about uh, policies, about political environment, all the usual uh, suspects, economics, complexity, life cycle thinking, um, circular economy. So really all of the elements that we, uh, we were expecting. And building from there, we were like, OK, what do we have? What can we use that we have? And how should people go about it? How should they go about the delivery? What would make it easier for them? Because this can be a bit of sort of reskilling um, as well, if, if needed. Or it can be maybe just giving access to uh, materials. Now I'm going to go through this quite fast. But if anyone is, uh, because I'm going to talk about the, the last uh, project too. Um, so we spoke about materials, and on this slide you have some examples of materials that people were using and or that they have heard of and they wanted to talk about. But honestly, if, you, if your specialism is dynamics and control, this is not something that you read on your day-to-day -day necessarily or you use. So uh, lots of effort. Um, then uh, um, we looked at delivery modes, sort of what kind of uh, teaching uh, or pedagogies work well because obviously sitting here and, and talking to people and sharing slides is not enough. 
um, and you need to do, uh, you, you maybe need the smaller cohorts, maybe you need more facilitation, you want interactive ways of teaching. So that's uh, some of the ideas that uh, colleagues came up with. Uh, and then we went on to sort of what it is that um, uh, that students uh, wanted to, uh, sort of what it is that uh, didn't work so well. So sort of this separation between sustainability and the rest of the curriculum, engaging students, and this goes back to that point about the professional uh, aspect of it, because this is also seen as an add-on. So it's like, how does this connect? If it's not embedded, how do we draw from this? Uh, then um, um, sort of the, the linking with technical content was difficult, so how do we make it more, uh, more relevant? And then the time consuming element, like workload is the sort of at the top of the list all the time, and it's, it's a real challenge. Um, and then we finished by looking at what would make it easier for people. So they said that they wanted more clarity. They wanted sort of top-down clarity of what it is that the faculty wants, what it is that the program wants, um, and what, what can we do to be consistent rather than everybody in their corner dreaming of what they should be doing. And then they wanted collaboration. They wanted help with assessments, with teaching materials, uh, and they wanting a, wanted a network of educators to, to work with. So we've been uh, working uh, on that. Um, so we are working on creating this database. So we have the website, it's called TREES, Teaching Resources in Engineering Education for Sustainability. But it's empty at the moment. We are now uh, creating the resources. Um, um, and uh, that's a, a paper that uh, we wrote uh, and we presented the last year at CEFI together. And based on this, uh, my colleagues and I were also part of the EPC. Uh, so this is the Engineering Professors Councils, uh, Council in the UK. It's not just for professors. They let you in even if you're not yet uh, a, a full professor. Uh, so they've developed a sustainability toolkit, and we were part of the group um, informing this. So have a look um, if you'd like. I will leave this topic there because I only have 15 minutes left and another project to talk about. So only if there is a sort of pressing question, but on and just on this project. Yes. Just a quick one. Yes. Do your students understand what sustainability means? I think my current students uh, do because we are. It's so much in their sort of day to day on the program, but. Traditional on traditional programs, I'm not sure. Most of the times, it's really just a, a matter of climate change or something. That's that's kind of like they, they put sort of environmental sustainability at the top, and they don't think, for example, of, of any other aspects of. Mm -hmm. So yeah, are you finding the same uh, here? They yeah. Oh, so that at least that. <laughs> I mean, that's another side of the coin, and we obviously want to to have it all. You know, we want to give a comprehensive uh, picture. But yeah, definitely, and that's why, and I think that's why that call for um, uh, for sort of um, institutional framework as well. Because if you ask staff what is sustainability, they will define it differently as well, because there's so many aspects of it. Um, so yeah, that is that is definitely one of the. Uh, the tensions. Yes. Very good one. Are you interested in co-creating your three resources? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm very happy to. Yes. 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 So let's. Uh, yeah. Let's. Uh, let's talk about it. Um, definitely would be interested because uh, we were. So one of the tensions with this was uh, also about uh, quality assurance and recognition. So we have a system whereby people have to log in. There's a sort of attribution of resources to institutions. People. So everything is very uh, visible. So yeah, collaborating on on populating the database would be uh, would be very useful. <laughs> Mm. No, it can be. Law interest in sustainability, health interest, and engineering interest. So again, I'm not like, you could be interested to even more than that. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. But at the same time, I think also we should be bringing other 
so th this is in a way kind of one of the ways to bring transdisciplinarity in engineering, yeah. right? So I think anything that is transdisciplinary would fit in this, even though there's the word engineering there. Oh, no, no. What's happening? <laughs> okay, <laughs> still here. I have one more project to tell you about. So yeah, let's let's take it offline, and that would be wonderful and very helpful. Yeah, I've just. This is the last one. I promise. Uh, so this is about inclusive engineering education. Um, uh, I've been working quite a lot, both on sort of pre-university provision and on impact and support for current students. Uh, my aim is to move into also the sort of completion and alumni success, because it's one thing to get students admitted onto the program and one other thing to get them to graduate successfully. Um, so really trying to look at the entire um, landscape in this strand of my work. And this has actually started in a very random way, uh, where uh, in the final year of my PhD, I decided to get a part-time job as a research assistant in the School of Education, where I went and I taught uh, physics in the woods outside of Bristol to Key Stage 3 students to give you a sense Key Stage 3 is, um, um, is university, is sort of secondary school. Um, so on that, we were looking at the impact of school exclusion on, on students' um, attainment um, and sort of what, what happens to the students who experience exclusion in school. How do they go on to access engineering education and how do they go um, about um, completing? Um, and also a lot of the times exclusion, at least in the UK, uh, can happen because um, students just don't respond well to the classroom environment. So it could be a matter of neurodivergence or, or just really people being too uh, you know, um, active and, and they want something else. So um, it was really, really important to provide a new environment. Um, and here we wanted to look at how it is that these students behave and, and engage in the learning uh, process uh, outdoors. So we work with two classrooms, so about 30 students who are at risk of exclusion, so at risk of being expelled from their schools um, in the Bristol area. Um, and we looked at some um, categories, we looked at how creative they were, how uh, much attention uh, they paid. Uh, we looked at the teacher versus adult, uh, or sorry, uh, slash adult role, and sort of how easy it was to teach in this new environment. And of course, you might say that part of it is really because people are finding it exciting to be outdoors, but this was not a one-off. We went out there 10 times or so, so it was a, a full uh, module. We pulled logs up the hill, we did archery, we built tall structures. They were very, very um, um, collaborative, very engaged. They worked together well. Students that would normally not talk to each other really pulled together quite literally uh, during the project. Also looked at risk because, you know, with these students, you don't want them around knives sometimes, or at least in schools. Uh, they try to, to keep the environment as safe as possible, but we let them use a lot of uh, equipment, obviously with training, uh, and they find it, found it really, really useful. So there is really something about providing a learning environment that is feasible and <clears throat> appropriate for the learner, uh, and that's what this was about. We really managed to, to immerse them uh, into this um, experience, and this is the sort of five pillars. I'm sorry, I have to rush because we <laughs> had so many conversations, so uh, running uh, out of time, but uh, I'll try to finish in the next three, four minutes. Uh, and I'll share the slides anyway, so uh, you can have a look and we can uh, uh, talk about it. But this is really the, uh, the dimensions that we look into and we talk about in our paper. And based on this, we started uh, co-creation uh, research projects. This is a blog. Uh, where I worked with, so um, I'm an engineer, uh, my colleague Helen specializes in education, and then Myra and Jules, they were PhD students, one from engineering, one from education. So again, that idea of working together across, um, across disciplines, uh, and we wanted to look at how the stories of success, 
So the first project was about working with children in school. The second project is talking to students who have been excluded, but they're now studying engineering at a university in the UK. And we wanted to look at the positive side. So what is it that made it from them? What helped them overcome those barriers? So that was the idea of this um, second uh, project. And maybe how we can we as universities capitalize on that uh, and, um, and, and help students uh, succeed or other students come to university. So um, I'm not going to show you the results because we don't have time, but we had 133 participants from six universities. And if anyone wants to hear about about this uh, project again, I'm at your disposal. And then uh, the last sort of item I want to close with is the outreach and widening participation work, which is really research informed. Um, did a lot of it addressing various categories of stakeholders, a lot of um, interventions, either one time or programs. Um, launched in, in Bristol, but I'm continuing with this work um, at UCL, uh, very present. Um, so here's some pictures from our work experience. Irene was there running it alongside me uh, and uh, other colleagues. This is work that we were doing with the students. You recognize some Sterling engines there. Uh, that was Irene's department and then mine, the multi-story buildings. Um, this is us doing fairs and exhibitions. <laughs> um, so it's really uh, important to create this pipeline. And, but then again, supporting students once at university as well. Don't take it for granted that if they come, then it means they will also graduate and that they will have a good time while doing it. Um, and based on that, we've just also started a research project on how we pitch the program that I started with, the BSc Science and Engineering for Social Change. So this is really about mapping the UK curriculum to, um, um, to the um, program and seeing how we can interact with schools. Because we say that students don't understand the program, but neither do teacher or parents. So we're doing uh, grout uh, breaking work uh, there. And it's called Step Up. And we have an online platform. But I'm not going to show you that, because I'm out of time. So uh, if you want to hear more about research-informed uh, outreach and widening participation for a transdisciplinary project, uh, please let me know. Um, so yeah, we mapped the whole curriculum. <laughs> Uh, and I'm and then uh, uh, also doing some DI work with the APC. Uh, I have other program projects too. So if you want to hear about any of those, but really I will uh, I will leave it here. Uh, I'm here in the buildings until the 9th of April. So if you want to uh, to get in touch with me, please uh, email me directly or or Iran. Uh, and those are the two events so tomorrow, community-based placements, if you want to hear more about that. Uh, and then next week, more about transdisciplinarity. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there. I'm sorry I uh, went up to the wire. Any final, if you have any other final questions, I mean, you know, we, I'm still here, so I can take questions if you don't need to go immediately. Thank you very much for your attention.